Dad came after me in a parking garage in Newport Beach, California on August 20th, 2016. He grabbed me by the waist, looked me in the eyes and said, do you remember me? And from that moment, I fought for my life. I brought up my arm to protect myself, to protect my heart. This was an automatic defense that my body did to just protect my vital organs. And then and then he continued to stab me, and I thought I was getting punched. And from there, I fought for my life. I ended up on the ground. I realized now that he had a knife, because the knife was in a Del Taco bag before. The knife ended up on the floor. I grabbed the knife, and I defended myself, and that's how I defended myself in the knife attack. This is why you should be careful what you put in the mail. In 2015, a man was asked by his neighbor to collect his mail while he was gone for a few weeks. A few days later, a large package arrives on his neighbor's front porch. The man can barely lift it, but gets over to his garage where he accidentally drops it and hears something break inside. Hoping his neighbor would think the damage occurred en route, he closes his squeaky garage door and forgets about it. But over the next couple of days, whatever was in that package started to smell so bad that he decides to open it up. Inside were two very important finds, his neighbor, who was dead, and a camera that was still recording. The police bring the man in for questioning and show him what was on the camera inside the box. It starts with his neighbor talking to the camera about how excited he is to mail himself home for his YouTube channel. Then, police fast forward to the very end where they see that the neighbor is now sleeping in the box, and then suddenly gets dropped and you hear a crack, and that's his neck breaking. And then you hear a squeaky garage door close. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the case of Kanika Jenkins and the conspiracy that she was lowered into a hotel freezer where her organs were then harvested. This theory is pretty dark, so if you can't handle that, please keep scrolling. So the story starts off in the Crown Plaza Hotel in Chicago. Now, a lot of people believe that this hotel is used for illegal organ transplants and is involved in the black market for organs. So Kanika was attending a party there and she was quite drunk and I'm gonna show you a clip which is very disturbing. So as you can tell, she's very intoxicated. She must have been drunk or on something, which is usual when you go to a party and she's just stumbling around. And then she's found in the hotel's kitchen walking towards something and that's the last clip of her ever. Her body was then found in a freezer. However, when they asked the hotel for the footage of her walking to the freezer, they said there was no camera there. Come back for part two. Last Gypsy, one of her first memories is... This is the moment right before this woman was fatally shot live on TV. Alison Parker was a budding young journalist from Martinsville, Virginia. She graduated from James Madison University and in 2014, she started working on air. This was for the morning show of WDBJ7. It was early in the morning of the 26th of August 2015 when Alison and her cameraman, 27-year-old Adam Ward, were preparing for a broadcast. Alison had actually just celebrated her 24th birthday and she was getting back into the swing of work. The pair were due to cover the 50th anniversary of the Smith Mountain Lake. In the middle of a live interview though, something horrific would take place. It was around 6.45am and during the live broadcast, a man in black approached. Terrifyingly, he was carrying a gun. Suddenly, he fired at Allison and he then turned the weapon onto Adam. He fired shots at the woman that was being interviewed called Vicky Gardner. She actually thought quickly and played dead on the floor. Terrifyingly, the camera was still rolling and broadcasting to the horrified viewers at home as Allison and Adam lay dead. The gunman then fled the scene. The cameras were cut by the control room and the live feed cut back to the stunned journalist in the studio. They understandably could not process what had just happened. Police raced to the scene and Vicky was rushed to hospital and thankfully survived her gunshot wound. The other journalists at the news station thankfully actually recognized who the gunman was. They told police the shooter was Vesta Flanagan. He'd actually previously worked for the news station until he was sacked for making staff feel uncomfortable. He had a history of being sacked from jobs due to bizarre behavior and threatening people. It transpired that Vesta had planned out his shooting in detail. 
He tweeted a confession shortly after and posted a video of the shooting to his Facebook. Police were obviously desperate to track him down, but before they could do so, he crashed his car and unalived himself. Pedrinho Matador, o maior serial killer do Brasil, foi de arrasta pra cima e eu vou contar quem que foi esse cara e por que que tá todo mundo falando dele agora. A gente acredita que ele tenha matado pelo menos 71 pessoas, porém em várias entrevistas ele afirmou ter matado mais de 100 pessoas e na sua maioria essas pessoas eram outros criminosos. Ele nasceu em Santa Rita do Sapucaí, que fica em Minas Gerais, no dia 17 de julho de 1954. E a primeira vez que ele matou, gente, ele tinha 13 para 14 anos de idade. Sim, ele era muito novo e ele matou o vice-prefeito da cidade porque o cara tinha demitido o pai dele. Apesar disso, o pai dele não era uma pessoa assim, assim não era flor que se cheirava, sabe? Então, ele agredia muito o Pedro, agredia muito a mãe e tempos depois a mãe do Pedro foi encontrada morta. Nisso, ele decidiu que ia se vingar do assassino e ele acabou de descobrindo que quem tinha matado a mãe era o próprio pai dele e ele matou o pai. Em uma entrevista que ele deu pro Marcelo Rezende, pra vocês terem uma noção, ele confessou que ele esfaqueou o pai 22 vezes e também mastigou parte do coração. E essa é uma das maiores lendas em volta desse cara, que ele teria comido o coração do próprio pai, porém em várias entrevistas ele falou que ele só mastigou, foi isso que ele falou. Ele foi condenado a mais de 100 anos de prisão, porém ele cumpriu 34 anos preso e ele foi liberado pela última vez em 2018. E como eu disse, a maioria das vítimas eram outras pessoas que eram criminosos e que estavam tipo na mesma penitenciária que ele. Inclusive, em 1973, quando ele foi transferido para a penitenciária, o cara que estava no carro policial junto com ele foi encontrado morto. E quem matou o cara que estava junto com ele foi o Pedro e os dois estavam algemados. Ele conseguiu matar o cara algemado. Inclusive, ele ficou preso na mesma penitenciária que o maníaco do parque. E essa treta vale um vídeo só sobre isso, porque é uma fofoca, gente, gigantesca. Comentem aí se vocês querem, aliás. Em 2018, ele foi liberado da prisão. Meses depois, ele criou um canal no YouTube, que era Pedrinho Ex-Matador, o nome. E ele participou de vários podcasts. Ele tinha conta aqui no TikTok que ele postava, fazia live. E hoje de manhã, por volta das 10 horas da manhã, ele foi encontrado morto. Basicamente, de acordo com as testemunhas, ele estava segurando uma criança de colo quando um carro preto parou, seis homens desceram e alvejaram ele. Quando a polícia chegou, o Pedro já estava morto, mas não aconteceu nada com a criança que ele estava segurando no colo. Ou seja, ele tinha muitos inimigos, ele fez várias entrevistas onde ele falava que ele matava por prazer na maioria das vezes. Ele tinha uma tatuagem escrita, mato por prazer, mas nos últimos anos ele tinha se convertido ao cristianismo e tal, era uma pessoa nova e falava que só mataria se alguém mexesse com a família dele, enfim. Mas morreu hoje, né? Morreu agorinha. This is the disturbing case of the Turpin House of Horrors. In January 2018, police in California got a phone call. The 17-year-old daughter of David and Louise Turpin had jumped out of a window to escape her home. On the phone call, she sounded nervous and said, um, I just ran away from home. What would follow would be the uncovering of years of abuse and trauma. David and Louise Turpin were apparently strict Christians. They believed that God wanted them to have as many children as possible, so they had 13. They fed each child only once per day. They only allowed them one shower a year, and they physically abused them. The children were clearly pale and malnourished. The house they lived in was disgusting. It was completely overrun with junk and rotting rubbish. Disturbingly, on the floor, there was human excrement as well as dead pets. Thankfully, one child, Jordan Turpin, was able to get free and in doing so, saved her siblings. Jordan's childhood was terrible. By the time she was 13, her family moved to California. Alarm bells should have rang for people when, in 2014, neighbors found the Turpins' abandoned trailer. Inside was like something from a horror film. It was full of feces, dead animals, and even restraints tied to beds. Things didn't change when they moved to California. Jordan would later describe her living conditions as hell. The children were chained up for months at a time and had regular beatings. Her 11-year-old sister was so malnourished that her arm was actually the size of a four-month-old baby's. Jordan decided to steal her parents' phone in order to try and communicate with the outside world. A few times she was successful. 
She eventually managed to start chatting to somebody on social media and they advised that she called the police. However, when Jordan's mum found out about her stealing the phone, she actually started to strangle her. This caused Jordan to have repeated nightmares about her mum killing her and she knew it was now or never. Her plan was set in motion. She put pillows under her duvet cover so it looked like she was asleep in the bed. She managed to climb out the window and bravely phone the police. When police arrived, the parents acted extremely casual. Police started exploring the property and could immediately see the amount of neglect that was going on. They also saw the amount of abuse and even saw children chained to the beds and had to ask the parents where the keys were to free the children. The Turpin parents were charged with 12 counts of false imprisonment, 12 counts of torture and many counts of abuse. Although they pled not guilty, they were thankfully sentenced to life in prison. This is a case of 19-year-old Melissa Witt and how she was abducted from a bowling alley parking lot. Melissa Witt was born on April 20th, 1975 in Fort Smith, Arkansas to her mother Marianne and to her father Johnny. Parents divorced when she was a child, so she was pretty much just raised by her mother Marianne and they had a really close relationship. They would do everything together and Marianne was really overprotective of Melissa. Friends describe Melissa as being kind, bubbly, quirky, and just a really nice person. At the time, Melissa was currently enrolled in community college and she also had a part-time job working as a dental assistant and her dream after college was to become a dental hygienist. Everything seemed to be going well for Melissa, but on December 1st, 1994, that would all change. That day, 19-year-old Melissa got up and she got ready for school just like any other day. Before she headed out, she actually asked her mother Marianne if she could borrow some money, but Marianne said no. So this kind of caused some type of argument between them and Melissa left the house kind of upset with her mother. This really wasn't like a massive fight, it was just more of like a disagreement and you know by the next day Marianne and Melissa would have been over it. So after having the disagreement with her mom, Melissa continues to get ready and then she heads over to school. Once classes ended, she went to Chick-fil-A to go have some lunch with her best friend and then afterwards she headed to work. The shift ended at around 5 p.m. and when she got inside her car to start heading home, the car wouldn't start. Melissa was freaking out about this, you know, she didn't know what had happened, but thankfully there were some witnesses nearby that were able to come over and, you know, help her start the car. Melissa figured that maybe she accidentally left the car lights on and that had drained the battery. So after getting her car fixed, she headed home. When she walked inside the door, she realized that her mother wasn't home but that she had left her a note. This note told her to go meet her at a local bowling alley called Bowling World. Now Marianne was upset about the fight that they had earlier in the day, so she wanted to invite her daughter over to Bowling World to have some dinner, you know, buy her a burger, and just kind of like talk about what had happened that morning. So she quickly changed, she got inside her car, and she headed over to Bowling World. Meanwhile, Marianne is already inside Bowling World waiting for her daughter to arrive. But Melissa never shows up. Marianne doesn't freak out, you know, she figures that maybe Melissa was still upset about their argument in the morning, you know, maybe she went to go hang out with her friends, and that was it. She waited at the bowling world for some time, but since Melissa never showed up, she decided to just go home. She figured that when she would get home, she would just see Melissa inside, and they would talk everything out then, but when she got home, Melissa was not there. Marianne thought that this was weird. I mean, Melissa didn't leave a note explaining that she was going to go to her friend's house or anything like that, so where was Melissa? Marianne continued to wait around but when midnight came she started to grow even more concerned because this was so unlike Melissa it was a Thursday so that meant that the next day you know was Friday Melissa would have school and have work so it was just not normal for her to stay out until midnight Marianne started calling around to all of Melissa's friends but no one knew where she was she called the police to report Melissa as missing but when she told the police about their argument that they had in the morning they just figured that Melissa was a runaway but Marianne knew that her daughter would never do this she would never willingly leave okay more in part too. Harbo Bester was born into a world of darkness, his existence marked by tragedy and crime. Born on June 13, somewhere between 1983 and 1986, his mother was only 16 when she was brutally raped by a local storekeeper who offered her a ride home after visiting her sister. He was subsequently raised by his grandparents, and from a very young age he seemed to be destined for a life of crime. When he was only four years old, his grandfather found him in possession of a large wand of cash, and after confronting Tarbo, he told him that a neighbor had given it to him. His grandfather then took him to the lady's house, and when they got there, she didn't even know that the money was missing. A year later, when Tarbo was five, the owner of a local tavern confronted the family after Tarbo admitted to stealing a bottle of coins from the family's home. By the time Tarbo was 17 years old, he had already completed his first stint in prison, he was charged and convicted of house burglary and stealing from someone in the community. In 2004, he was released into the care of his mother, 
but his criminal tendencies continued to flourish. In 2005, just as social media was gaining momentum, Tarbo Bester embarked on a new career as a con man. Posing as an international scout, he approached aspiring models online and promised to send them for auditions and arrange brand collaborations, all for a fee to belong to his fake agency. However, it wasn't just money that he took from his victims. He would gain their trust, meet some of them in person, and then rob them of their possessions. His scheme was eventually uncovered in 2009 when he was charged with fraud and sentenced to three years in prison. Despite serving only two years, he was released on parole in 2011, ready to wreak havoc once again. Shortly after his release in 2011, Tarbo doubled down on his deceitful ways, taking his model agency scam to new heights. He continued with his scam of pretending to be an international scout, but now also forged paperwork to secure chartered planes, luxurious hotel rooms, and expensive camera equipment, all while providing fake payment receipts. He'd then fly down aspiring models with promises of success, only to rob them of their possessions and sell the expensive camera equipment he acquired. He was eventually nabbed at the end of 2011 where he was charged for robbing and raping two women. Tarbo was then released on bond while the investigation continued. That same year, he also met an aspiring model and car saleswoman, Nomfundo Tihulu, who sold him a BMW. He once again posed as an international talent scout and quickly charmed his way into Nomfundo's life. The two became close and eventually dated for a short while before Bester stabbed her to death at a bed and breakfast in Cape Town. He was arrested in 2012 and found guilty of the murder of Nomfundo Tihulu as well as the rape and robbery of the two women in 2011. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. They look like a happy couple, don't they? Well, you're wrong. Newlywed Jordan Graham got a text from her husband Cody on the evening of June in 2013. He told her that he's driving with some friends for the day, that he won't be back until later. The 25-year-old girl from Montana had just gotten married to Cody 10 days prior, and she was really hoping that they would be spending more time with each other, but... Cody just had to go. A day passed and Cody had not gotten back home, nor has he contacted her. And then another day passed, still no Cody. And that's when she finally asked his family and friends if they had seen him. Neither Cody's family nor his friends have been in contact with Cody. Now that made Cody's family very frantic. It's not like Cody to do this. Following day, Jordan got an anonymous email from someone regarding Cody. The email read, my name is Tony. There's no bother looking for Cody anymore. Cody's gone. I saw your post on Twitter and I thought I would email you. He had come with some buddies and met up with me on Sunday night in Columbia Falls. He was saying he needed to be with his buddies for a bit and take them for a joy ride. A couple of the guys came back saying that they had gone for a ride in the woods somewhere and Cody got out of the car and went for a little hike and they're positive. He fell in and he is dead. Sorry, Jordan. I don't know who the guys were, but they took off. So call off the missing persons report. Cody is gone forever. Signed, Tony. Jordan turned to her friends. She didn't know what to do. Her friends were like, Jordan, what are you doing? Call the cops, don't call us. Authorities were called. The search for Cody then ensued. During the search, Jordan had the strangest revelation. While searching for Cody with one of her girlfriends at Glacier National Park, she said she had a feeling that Cody's body would be over some steep cliff. Her friend was like, no way, there's a wall that blocks us from that cliff. Why on earth would he be there? But Jordan hops the wall anyway. And to her surprise, Jordan was right. There, lying 200 feet below them on this pristine tiny river was 25-year-old Cody Johnson, dead. Authorities were contacted right away and they retrieved Cody's body. People still had many questions. The day of Cody's funeral came and Jordan was a bit off. And while people grieved differently, everyone that observed Jordan's demeanor had a revelation of their own. Jordan was sitting in the chair, texting, and from time to time even laughing at her phone, while her parents and everyone else at the funeral was bawling their eyes out. Instantly, people knew that Jordan was responsible for Cody's death. Going back to their honeymoon night, eight days before Cody went missing, Jordan got cold feet. As it turns out, Jordan had married Cody because she just wanted a wedding, a celebration that she was thrilled about planning. But when it was all over, she knew she had to consummate the marriage. And even though Cody was a handsome young man, very sweet, polite, 
and caring, Jordan never loved Cody and decided she'd rather kill him than be honest with him about her feelings. But cops did not need a confession from Jordan. The FBI was already hard at work trying to figure out who was behind the alleged email. They discovered the email was traced to a computer belonging to Jordan's stepfather. Not only that, but National Park security cameras showed Jordan driving to the park with Cody the day that he went missing. Jordan gave a full-fledged confession and she said that a couple days prior to reporting him missing, she had taken him to his favorite spot in Glacier National Park where she told him to take her hand and to close his eyes, which he did because he trusted her. She said she was going to lean in to give him a kiss and instead of giving Cody a kiss, she pushed him over the ledge where Cody fell to his death. Jordan was arrested and sentenced to life in prison. As for Cody's family and friends, they all had one question. Why? Why didn't she just call the marriage off instead of pushing Cody off a cliff, killing Cody? Cody's best friend was interviewed for a show and throughout that interview, he would break down and have to stop. He mentioned that Cody was the perfect guy for a girl and that he wished Cody was still alive. Rest in peace, Cody. Condolences to your family. Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Y'all, I don't know if in my life I have ever heard of a story that is as horrible as the one that I'm about to tell you. This, y'all, has a huge trigger warning attached to it. It deals with infants and toddlers. So if this is going to bother you because it really does have graphic discussion attached to it, then you might not want to watch this video. In all my years of being an investigative reporter and all my years of being, you know, someone who lives and watches crime shows and, you know, finds every documentary that there is, honestly, this is it. This is one of the worst. Y'all, a two-year-old toddler is dead tonight after his parents let him rot to death in his bed. You heard that right. They let him rot to death in his bed. So who are these wonderful people who could allow their child to rot to death in its bed? This is his mom, Takesha Williams, 24 years old. This took place in Bartow City, in the city of Bartow, excuse me, in the state of Florida. And the boy's father, 25-year-old Ephraim Allen. Again, this is a huge trigger warning, but trigger warning. This story starts in July of 2020, when this baby that we're talking about was 10 months old. Somehow he wandered into a pool at, his, at the family's rental, and he had a near drowning experience. Paramedics, EMT doctors, everyone worked for hours to try to save this baby's life. And unfortunately, they got his heartbeat, but he had no brain function. He couldn't open his eyes and he couldn't move any of his extremities. In fact, the doctors told his parents, those two lovely people we just saw, that they would probably be better off taking the baby off of child support because what kind of a life would this baby endure not being able, with zero brain function. His lovely parents said, nope, we are not going to do that. We're going to take him home with us. So he was sent home on a ventilator with a stomach tube. The only way that this baby could live was with that ventilator and the stomach tube. In addition, home health care workers were also assigned to this baby's case to help the parents three days a week. And just for a little bit more incentive or to piss you guys off even more, his mother actually was getting money from the state to take care of her baby, this 10 month old. So she didn't have to work. She didn't work because she was getting money to take care of him. And oh boy, did she not take care of him. In fact, in October of 2022, October of last year, the family, the parents actually started rejecting the home health care. Um, now, home health care aides say that they went to the house numerous times, knocked on the door. Nobody was there. One time when they let them in, they said, oh, no, don't bother him. The baby's asleep. We'll talk. We'll let you see him next time. And there was no next time. The home health care aid agency just stopped trying to even go because the family was 
non-receptive. They didn't answer the door, door. They didn't answer the phone. So they essentially stopped getting any home health care that there any ha- home health care that was available to them. So in May of this year, his mother called 911 and said that they are he's hooked up to a ventilator, but his pulse ox is not working. He told 911 she told um the 911, the dispatch center It's not an emergency. We don't want lights or anything. Just come here as like a routine check because we don't think it's that big of a deal. So that's exactly what the EMTs did. You guys, when they got there, every single person who has handled this case has said they've never seen anything worse, any child in worse condition than this baby. When they got there, they noticed that, yes, the baby was hooked up to a ventilator still, but he was not getting any oxygen. Something was going on. In fact, he was cold to a touch. He essentially seemed to be passed away, to have already been dead. So he was rushed to the hospital where, again, they tried. They had lots of efforts to try to save his life. And unfortunately, it didn't. none of those life-saving efforts worked. It was then that police were called in and actually the homicide case uh, detectives were called in as well. And when the detectives arrived and saw that baby, they said they have never again seen anything like this in their in their life huge trigger warning coming up you guys we're going to be talking about some graphic things the police said that the baby his stomach was very extended so it looked like he was pregnant not only that his stomach was green in addition they said as soon as they saw the baby he smelled like he was decomposing already so he clearly had been gone for a while This baby had ulcers gaping through his body to his muscles, dozens of ulcers. He had no rectum. They said it was just like a big hole there that where you could actually see his intestines and his spinal column. As if that's not bad enough, it gets worse. He had sepsis bilateral pneumonia, stage five ulcers, and also, of course, very visibly seen child neglect. Police said this baby was rotting in his bed. They said that when they got to the home, it smelled of decomposition as well, meaning that this baby could have been dead for who knows how long, but more so than that, he was being, he was suffering since at least, they believe, the last few months, probably since October, the last time that the home health aides came to the house. The parents said, oh, we didn't want um, anyone to come to the house because we were afraid that um, defects would come and take our other children. You freaking think you should not have children. Sheriff Grady Judd from Polk County, Florida, did a press conference on this horrific case. Let's listen to what he has to say. I've done this for five decades. I have seen thousands of children abused, hundreds of children murdered at the hands of parents. I had never seen the horror that we saw with this poor child at the hands of these two folks. These monsters are behind bars right now facing Aggravated manslaughter charges, to me it should be way worse than that. It should be murder charges. And they're being held on $100,000 bond. You guys, this is one of the worst cases, if not the worst, I have ever heard. I want to hear, I want to talk about this. I want to hear what you guys think. Let's discuss in the comments.